Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a long, the end of a long day for Deepwater Ministries. And I mean today, it's been deep water. We are in the great state of Missouri and the great state of confusion right now. Uh, we came to bury my brother who passed away and take care of his personal things. And today, I don't know what it happened down in Texas. I don't know what happened wherever you are, but we got a rain today that Noah would have been proud of. Uh, you can't get in anybody's yard without going in about ankle deep, still in the water, or at least the mud. And <laughs> it's just been... We started the morning wet, we ended the day wet, and we're probably going to have to get wet again before we finish it up tonight. But praise the Lord, we're still making it. God is good. He's on the throne. I'm not griping about water because I hope it came to Texas. We need it as more than any time I've seen in the last 25 years. Let's get to it tonight. Uh, I thank you all for your prayers. I thank you for your thoughts, those of you that have contacted us and those of you that have just prayed for us. And, 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 and you don't have to contact us, but thank you for praying for us at, at the home going of my brother. Uh, he was a good man and a, an excellent musician, just absolutely excellent musician. In his day, in his time, probably as good a musician as you could find anywhere in the country. And that's absolutely the truth. That's not an exaggeration. That's not a, that's not hyperbole. He was that good. He was that good. But like everything else, time and age caught up with him and he slowed down a little bit and his fingers wouldn't quite move where they're supposed to go anymore. Some of you understand that. I understand that a lot. And, uh, so he ended up back in his hometown, and and uh, here's where he started. Here's where he his life ended, and now he started life anew in the kingdom of heaven. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for uh, asking God to. I ask you to, uh, to pray for us as we do the funeral tomorrow, and then head back home. Uh, we would like to have traveling mercies because there's crazy people out there on the highway. Hey, let's talk. Let's talk in the book. Let's, let's talk about the book of Philippians tonight. How about that? We will. Uh, something everybody needs. Something everybody deals with. This is this is not a complicated message. This is not a uh, even 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 something that's you know newfound or uh, extra enlightening. It's just common day or everyday ordinary everyday common ordinary just sense common sense that's what i've been trying to say uh that the apostle paul leaves us each and every one for the times of trouble for the times of worry for the times of heartache for the times of just things not going your way Everybody experiences these times. Everybody goes through them. And if you say, well, I've never gone through them, wait on it. It'll be there. It'll show up. All right. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. You ought to know this without even opening your Bible. Be anxious for nothing. nothing. But in everything, by prayer, and supplication, which is almost a genuine begging, okay, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. If anyone ever had a uh, an excuse for worrying, fretting, being upset, it was the Apostle Paul. It had to be the Apostle Paul. His beloved Christian friends at Philippi, they had 
What once was a thriving, flowing church, now there was infighting. They were disagreeing with one another is a nice way of putting it. They were no longer getting along as Christians ought to do. And he was not there where he could come and help them to mediate the situation and, and fix everything and get it set back up. Divisions were creeping into the church. The church was in danger of splitting or falling completely apart, both in Philippi and in Rome. And added to these burdens, Paul was face, facing the possibility of his own death. Any day he could have been put to death. At any time, the decree could have come down, time's up, and Caesar was going to take his head. Now, Paul had good reason to worry. There's no doubt about it. Like I said, if anybody in the Bible had any reason to worry, it was Paul. But you know, he did not give in to worry. He didn't let worry get him down one bit. Instead, he took the time to explain to us he took the time out of his worry, out of his busy day, to explain to us the secret of victory through prayer. Victory through prayer. It starts out like this. What is worry? What is worry? The Greek word translated anxious. He said, be anxious for nothing. Or in some translations, careful uh, means to be pulled in different directions. Now that's what worry does. Worry pulls you in different directions because as you're worrying about something, you're seeing the good side, you're seeing the bad side, and it's it's straining you, pulling you each way. So that makes very good sense why why that why that word translates the way it does. Our hope pulls us in one direction, our fear pulls us in the opposite direction. And if we don't have the right kind of spiritual help, we will literally be pulled apart, okay? The English root word from which we get our word worry means to strangle. Oh, you're getting all kinds of lessons tonight. In fact, worry has a definite, has definite physical consequences to it. Think about it. Like I said, the definition in the English word is to strangle. Worry will give you a headache. You worry long enough, you'll get a headache. You worry bad enough, hard enough, you'll end up with an ulcer. Worry will make you old. Boop. Some of you have been worried way too long. I can already see it. Or at least make you feel old. Worry will wear you out. Wear you out. So how do we gain the victory through prayer? Thank you for asking that. We've got to where we wanted to go now. Here's how you do it. Victory through prayer. Be dependable in prayer. Be dependable in prayer. Paul does not write, pray about it. He was too wise to do that. He didn't say, just pray about it. No, 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 he doesn't do that. He uses three different words to describe right praying. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. The word prayer is a general word for making our request made known to God. It's talking to God and telling him what we need. It carries with it the idea also of adoration, devotion, and worship. Whenever we find ourselves worrying about anything, our first action should always be get alone with God and worship Him, praising Him for the glorious things that He has already done for us, knowing that what He has already done, He will do again or even do greater things than He's ever done before. Adoration or worship is what is needed uh, to, to be added to this because these only come when we start to recognize the real greatness of God. When we start to recognize the real greatness of God, worry doesn't have a chance in our lives because we can sit there and say, God's got this. God's got this. He's in control. This, this is where the, everybody used to say the things that let go and let God. That's what we're talking about. 
If you're going to hang on to it and worry and fear and fret, you're not letting God be the God that He wants to be. God's a great big God. Turn it loose, let it go, and let God take care of it. We have to come to realize that God is big enough to not only solve our problems, but to take care of anything that might come out above or around these problems. No matter which way they come at us, God is big enough to stop these problems in, our tra in, in their tracks. Too often we rush into God's presence and we just hastily tell Him our needs when we ought to be approaching His throne calmly and in the deepest reverence. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not faint. In other words, not lose heart. Some like victory because their, spare li their, their prayer life is spasmodic. That means they just pray here or there, hit and miss, jumping around from this, that, to the other. They, 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 they don't have a continual line with open line of communication with God. Now, God is always ready to talk to his own. But even more so, if he knows that we are going to be dependable in our prayers... For a dependable prayer warrior, God is a local call, and the line is never, ever busy. You, if you're a dependable prayer warrior, you will never get call, uh, uh, voicemail with God. God doesn't have one. You call, he'll talk. He will answer. Christians should live in a constant spirit of prayer. In everything we do, we ought to be praying. Anytime you start out of your house of, of a day to go to, go to your job what, or wherever it is you go, you ought to have a spirit of prayer about you for, for safety, for protection, for God's grace to go with you, and for the Holy Spirit to guide you wherever you go and use you for the glory of God wherever He takes you through the day. Christians, and, and, and you know, that too many Christians fail this to even praise God throughout the day. When we stop praising God for all things, then, then we lose track of who God is, what He is, and how He, how he actually is treating us at what, at what we're doing. If we will do these things, like I said, we will have the faith to believe and trust God even during the most harsh times in our life. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without there you go, ceasing. It's so very important that we learn to live consistently in an attitude of prayer. And again, I said be diligent in your prayers. The next part of the victory is supplication. This is an earnest sharing of our needs, our problems with God. Supplication means that we have an intensity in our hearts and our minds it always keeps us seeking God uh, no matter what the storm or trial is that comes upon us in our lives we are always seeking God hanging on to God clinging to God refusing to give up on our prayer life or the dreams that we have in front of us think of the woman with the issue of blood she should not have pushed her way through that crowd she should not have gone out of her house she was ceremonially unclean. She was breaking the law of, the, of all religions, being out there among the people. But what did she say? If I can just touch his clothes, I can be made well. I don't have to touch him. I don't have to get a hold of his hand. I don't have to grab him around the neck. If I can just touch his clothes. And what happened? She touched his clothes and Jesus felt the healing virtue flow from his body and she was made whole that very hour. Right then, right then she was taking, why? Because she was diligent. She did not let anybody stop her. She did not let her mind stop her. She didn't let her heart stop her. She didn't let the crowds thronging Jesus stop her. She had one goal, to get to God. That's what we're talking about, though, by being diligent in prayer. Everything you do, make it a point that you're going to get to God and stay with God 
in spite of what the world tries to tell you to do, what other people try to tell you to do, or even what the church tries to tell you to do. Supplication means that there is no place for some half-hearted or insincere prayer life. It is an all-out effort of seeking God for help in the time of need. Now, James spoke about, James, the brother of Jesus, spoke about this kind of prayer life when he said in, in chapter 5 of his letter, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. In other words, the, the effective, fervent prayer, the diligent prayer, gets a whole lot accomplished. See, that's, that's a whole lot easier reading than what the Bible, my Bible says, avails much. A lot of people doesn't understand that. This means gets a whole lot done. Fervent means ardent or impassioned or even blazing. The prayer life of many people proves ineffective because they're not really very intense or very devoted or very even very earnest in their prayer life. Their minds are diverted by their personal pursuits, their habits, their hobbies, the, the trivialities of their life. I can't pray right now, gun smoke's on. Well, I understand that to a certain degree, but if I've got a problem, Matt Dillon's just gonna have to take care of himself. I can't help him today, because if I've got a problem, I need to be talking to God, all right? Most of us while praying, really, most of us when, while we pray, we can think of a million different things that will distract us and keep us from really being diligent in our prayer life. I mean, well, I've got this I need to take care of. You're not going to go do that anyway, but the devil has put it in your mind that you need to go do it. Well, I prayed last week and God didn't answer my prayer, so I don't know why I'm praying today. That's of the devil. Get rid of him. Be diligent in your prayers. Don't let anything distract you from it. That's why Jesus talked about getting in your closet. Now, I didn't say you had to go get in your coat closet. Climb in, move the vacuum cleaner, the shoes, or whatever it is. Shut the door and stay in there with a bunch of coats. Jesus just simply meant get alone with God. Get alone with God. You and God, no distractions. Take it to the Lord in prayer and watch God work. Uh, distractions pull our mind away from God. They strangle any conversation we might have with him. If we would be victorious in our prayer, we must be fervent, we must be earnest and diligent in our prayers to the Lord. If you just heard that, we're under a flood warning. <laughs> I told you, it had come a marvelous rain here today. Diligent in prayer means to be attentive, busy, and even energetic in your prayer life. Let's cut to the chase. Be definite in your prayers. Be definite in your prayers. Christians have to, we have to cease being vague and vague and indifferent in our prayer life. What are you talking about? How many people have you ever heard, Lord, save souls? What souls? Whose souls? Just souls in general. That's not, that's not really what God's looking for here. That's not the way God really even works in the Bible. Lord, heal the sick. Which sick? What sick? Who's sick? Change lives. Whose life? Where? What state? What country? You know, which one of the sick? There's sick people everywhere. They say, oh, change lives. Who do you want changed? Well, we all could use change if we really got down and, and admitted it. Jesus, think about when Jesus was talking to blind Bartimaeus. A blind man, a beggar sitting beside the road. He kept crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples of Jesus said, shh, be quiet, don't bother the master. 
And Jesus said, tell him to come over here to me. And they said, oh, hey, Jesus wants you to get up and come on. And what did Jesus do to him? What did Jesus do? He said, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus didn't say, heal the blind. Heal the sick. Change lives. No, 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 no. He got down where it lived. He was specific in everything he said right here. Lord, that I may receive my sight. I want to see. See, there's no hesitation here. There, there is no indifference here. There's no, oh, just let all the blind people see or heal the blind. No, he had a definite prayer. I want to be made whole. I want my eyes to work. And what happened? Jesus gave him back his sight. Jesus gave him back his sight. Why? Because of specific prayers. Specific prayers. Victory comes through prayer. And especially to those who believe and pray specifics. I've taught this all my ministry, but I truly believe it. Pray specific. Don't just throw a, a bucket of water out there and hope it hits whatever target you're going for. Hit the point. Hit the point. Now, that does not mean that there will not be times that are so severe or so troubling or so devastating that we cannot, that, or that we can coherently put together a coordinated prayer. At times, we may be only able just to, to cry before the Lord. I mean, tears, just, we, we, can't, we can't get the words out of our mouths, is what I'm trying to say. And we just just fill with tears and anguish and heartache and all these type things. Uh, our, our life, things in our lives may be so troubling or so devastating that we, we just can't put it all together. We, we don't have the words to express ourselves. At times, we may just be able to cry or struggle or just barely able to hold on. Or the situation may be, may be so big that all we can do is stutter and moan. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. That's when the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, will help us pray. Help us get the message to God so that God may come and deliver us through, from, and past our problems. Our problems. But we, when, when we can, when we can make definite requests, and be diligent in the exercise of prayer. Last one. Last one. Boy, we're waiting for this one. Why didn't you start with this one? We'd already been done. What a crowd. What a crowd. Be delighted in your prayers. Delighted in my prayers. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you ask. After adoration, after supplication, after all that comes, after it comes appreciation or the giving of thanks to God. He said, with thanksgiving. Even God likes to hear his children say, thank you. Did you ever think about it that way? Instead of just being the spoiled children that we often are, how, how many times do we just stop and say, God, Thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you're going to do. If God does not do one more thing for me in this life, he's already done a million times more than I deserve. And he simply did that by giving his son, the Lord Jesus, to die upon the cross for my sins. I don't know about your sins, but he died for mine. Bible says he died for all sinners, of which we all are part of the family. But I thank him especially that he died for my sins. I bring it home and make it personal. Uh, I said even God enjoys hearing his children say thank you. You remember when Jesus healed 10 lepers at one time? 
Ten lepers were passing by. Jesus healed them all. They all came to him and begged him for healing. He healed them all. What happened? One. One. How many? One. Came back and said, thank you. Nine walked off. Never looked back. They were healed. They were blessed, but they walked off and never said a word. One came back and said, thank you. I believe that leper, that man, got more out of that thank you than he even got from his healing from leprosy. Because even God likes an attaboy every now and then. Paul told the Ephesians that they were to be giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said, he told the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's break this down. And, and I'm, I'm running out of room here, so get ready. That does not mean we have to give thanks for all the bad things that happen. Oh, thank you, Lord, that I was in a car wreck today. No, no. Thank you, Lord, that I fell off the ladder and broke my back today. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Not what I'm talking about at all. But sometimes God will take even the most harsh things or the bad things in our lives to bring about something good. Did you ever think about that? Maybe your injury or your hurt will be your segue into the testimony to lead someone else to the Lord. My back was broken, but I am so much better now. I've gone through a lot, but I'm so much better now. Well, don't you blame God for allowing your back to be broken? I'm allowing, I thank God for healing me and touching me and making me so much better than I was. And I have a testimony that I didn't have before. No matter what the devil tries to do to me, God can do something better. And God is always bigger than the devil. We should spend at least as much time praising the Lord as we do petitioning him. The psalmist said it like this in Psalm 113. From the rising of the sun, ah, you know, way ahead of me, to its going down. That's right. The Lord's name is to be praised. Paul counsels us very simply to take everything to God in prayer. In other words, don't worry about anything. Pray about every. I just pray about everything. We are prone to pray about the big things, the big things in life, and, and we get forgetful to pray about the so-called little things in life. But little things left unchecked will become big things. So we need to be praying about everything, everything, talking to God about everything that concerns us and him is the real first step toward victory through prayer. And the result of all that is the peace of God will guard your heart and mind in everything we do. The peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds in everything we do. Worry is one of Satan's best weapons. It's a great joy stealer, a victory overcomer, all these type of things. It's one of the greatest thieves of our joy. And it's not enough for us to tell ourselves, quit worrying. Because that's never going to capture the, 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 the joy thief. That's never going to stop him. Worry is really an inside job. And it takes more than good intentions to get the victory over our worries in life. Again, Paul to the Philippians chapter four, verse seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses how much? Some, a little bit, mid-level, 
No, which surpasses all understanding. Well, guard your heart, and the emphasis here is guard like a soldier guards his or her post. Guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. We can have this victory through prayer. All we have to do is keep on praying. Praying in faith, believing God is bigger and stronger than any of our problems. And as long as we're in the deep water of prayer, Satan cannot defeat us, overcome us, beat us in any way. Just keep on trusting God, keep on praying, keep an open line of communication in all things. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in all things. That's it. God bless you. Let's pray together tonight. Father, I thank you that no matter what comes our way, no matter what the enemy brings against us and tries to confront us with, that you are there to help us, to strengthen us, to guide us, and direct us in everything that we do. I ask that you would open up our hearts and minds and let us learn to pray like you want us to pray. Cause our hearts to come alive in you in everything that we do. Let, let our prayers be earnest, let them be diligent, and let us be thankful for the things that you are doing and will do in our lives. God help deep water to grow. Keep causing us to share with one another and tell others about our ministry and help us cause each one of us to grow in the knowledge and in the wisdom of the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask you to help us tonight and we ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you. Thank you for letting deep water come into your homes. <laughs> deep water, all you got to do is go outside here. It's deep water. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be in your homes, your lives tonight, wherever you are. And remember, we're going to be back here Sunday. We won't, we won't be in Missouri. Hopefully we're back in Texas Sunday morning. But it's Easter morning. Easter morning. I heard the greatest quote just about an hour ago from a young lady who is one of the smartest, prettiest, most wise women that I know. And she's my 10 year old granddaughter. About Easter. Said they locked Jesus up and he escaped. We'll see you Sunday morning. Wait a minute. Got right here. Sunday morning. Remember, they locked him up, but he escaped. We'll see you Sunday morning.